Okay, so, so let's start. Um, okay, a few of you asked questions about grades and grade distribution and stuff like that, so I want to give you some information. So what you see here is the grade distribution for homework one. Um, so you can see where you are. Average was 88.5, median was 92. So it's pretty good. Uh, I know that a few of you had some questions to the graders, so hopefully all the questions have been answered. If not, uh, try to get them answered and, and ask me if they aren't. Uh, it's also the first time the graders are grading, so the, there were a few sort of questions on how exactly to grade. I mean, you're going to be in this position next year, so you know, uh, give them a little bit of a slack, but, but they should be uh, listening to, to your questions and, and respond to it. Uh, questions? People also ask about the general uh, class grade distribution. So this is kind of uh, grade distribution of the class. To give you an idea, uh, this is, I think, last year or, or two years ago, something like this distribution. So about half the class is getting some kind of an A, about half the class is getting some kind of a B. Shouldn't be anything below that uh, unless you really want it. Uh, so that, that's basically uh, kind of the distribution. Uh, as I said, I'm grading, I'm curving separately um, undergraduates and graduates, and I'm curving. So the absolute numbers really don't matter. This doesn't apply to the homework, but uh, I'm already responding to a question that you may ask after the midterm. So it's not always easy to scale a midterm such that you know, the average is going to be 86.5, and, uh, you know, it will be a nice distribution. Sometimes it's too hard. So, so given that there's a large class, it's relatively easy to, to curve it. Questions? I don't have questions today. Okay. So, uh, homework three is already out. Please look at it. Uh, it's, you have just about 10 days, so we gave it out. Tuesday night, and we want it back next Thursday night. Uh, I think it's a very nice homework uh, in the sense that you're going to learn something from it. Uh, uh, so I'm a little bit biased. Uh, but uh, I really think you'll learn something from it. I don't think it's a lot of work. Uh, you're going to implement three algorithms, five algorithms if you want, but it's the same algorithm. So you're implementing Perceptron, two versions, we know two versions, other grad. But if you really do, the, do it right, it's one algorithm, and there is an update rule that is different uh, in each of the algorithms. So, uh, and in addition, you have to run experiments, so you'll have to write some scripts to run the experiments. Uh, and it's good practice for you to know how to do this and to run experiments. So essentially, that's what you're going to do. You're going to implement a few good algorithms and, and see how they behave. We have given you um, a, a procedure to generate data, so you don't need to generate data. Of course, if you want to play with it, uh, we, we generate the data in a very specific way, uh, and we explain it there because we want to control sparsity. Uh, you can control many other things when you generate data, which we didn't. You can think about what are the positive examples or what are the negative examples that we generated. And if you have nothing uh, else to do, you can play with it and run experiment. You know, you can make the examples uh, set a little bit easier or a little bit harder and see what happens. Um, but for the problem set, we've generated data for you, and all you have to do is think a little bit about uh, how to run the experiments in an organized manner uh, and plot some graphs uh, and so on. So, um, questions? Okay. Final reminder is about projects. So the, the project proposals are due 
uh, in about two weeks. Uh, please think about it, you know, form groups. Uh, send me ideas, a few of you have already had. Uh, if you have some questions, if you don't have questions and you know what you want to do, it's okay. Uh, at the end, what you'll have to do is write no more than two pages, ideally one page of a proposal. It will have to have a couple of citations indicating that you know uh, what's the relevant or some of the relevant machine learning literature uh, on this, and, and that's basically it. Uh, people ask me for ideas, so here are ideas. Uh, you know, it's really uh, an infinite space. Here is the first one is actually a difficult problem. Understand NFL recaps. You can do it for other sports if you want. Uh, it's, it's a difficult problem. You can do something in it. Each one of these uh, is a different type of uh, machine learning project from theory to a uh, very open-ended uh, experimental project. Uh, and each one of them could be interesting. Some of these could be a beginning of a published paper. Uh, almost every year there were a few projects that eventually uh, were extended to a published project. Not all can do it, but, uh, but quite a few uh, have this uh, option. Uh, a few others. So, so this is, I, I mentioned here people identifier. So I found that uh, this kind of nice thing, footstep recognition can ID you at 10 paces. Small number of examples, and you can actually uh, figure out who's the person. This is a machine learning project that is uh, really interesting, really useful. You can think about many others, multi-word expressions, Conference program chair aid or journal editor aid. There's a lot of sub projects there that are really interesting. Uh, I mentioned a few of them. Help me choose a diverse program committee for a specific conference automatically. Really interesting, not easy. Uh, it's a publication if you can do something interesting here. Uh, Twitter. People like Twitter a lot. Identify gender, identify, you know, the, uh, political affiliation. A lot of other questions uh, are interesting here. Parse uh, hashtags. Uh, I bet some of these you don't understand. Maybe a few of you do. Uh, it's difficult for people too. Each hashtag actually means a lot of things. Uh, and... Uh, you can think about writing a program that does something on that. Okay, so a lot of ideas. Think about what you want to do uh, and uh, do something interesting. Questions? Yeah. So undergraduate students that, as far as I know, cannot register for four can do uh, a project. And this will, uh, as I said, this will be only extra credit for them. But are you a graduate student? No. So you can do it. So, but, but if you want to do it as an undergrad, you do the same thing as everyone else. Right? So you write a proposal, you ask questions, I'm going to give you, within a week after the proposal, I'm going to give you some comments. Uh, we are thinking about a way of kind of peer uh, reviewing of the proposals. We need to figure out some technical issues. If we manage to do it, you will all be able to give comments to everyone and see what other project people are working on uh, and do the project. So it's going to be the same process. The only thing is that you can't lose from doing it. I mean, hopefully no one is going to lose because the projects are going to be good, but uh, just to make sure and to encourage undergraduates to do projects, it's only going to help. Okay, so let's, let's start uh, with the class. So, so where are we? So, in fact, l let me remind you where we uh, were last week, um, or when was it, Tuesday. We talked about kernels. And uh, we basically uh, developed uh, 
develop the notion of dual representation and kernels in the context of perceptron. Uh, we understood what's dual spaces. We understood uh, what, uh, how to run perceptron in the dual space. We understood what kernels are. Uh, and we gave a lot of examples uh, for kernels. Uh, really, the idea is uh, we want to run linear functions, linear learners, and we want to do it in a more expressive space. That's the key idea. And what kernels allow you to do is to do this without incurring the cost of dot product in a huge dimensional space. Uh, now, you can do it in many, many spaces. So I'm giving here an example, which I'm not touching on, but you can click on this and go to it, on how you can define kernels in structure space. So for example, if you uh, feature space uh, are features that you extract from trees, for example, all sub-trees of a tree are features, or how many times a given sub-tree appears in a big tree is a feature, these kind of things, you can define kernels over this. So kernels basically are similarities in a high dimensional space. Uh, and people have developed kernels over a lot of spaces. Uh, the important thing that I wanted to, to convey is that uh, beyond you understanding dual spaces and kernels is that you have to really understand that there is a trade-off. And we talked a little bit toward the end about the, the various trade-offs. And, and it's important to understand. So once we are done with this, we can talk about uh, next steps. So, so we understood a lot of uh, or several linear learning algorithms. Uh, perceptron, we know gradient descent in general. We showed how perceptron is really a gradient descent algorithm. Uh, and we talked about it in the context of the mistake-driven learning uh, paradigm. So uh, really, the goal today is to talk more and more uh, about generalization, really to develop a theory of generalization. So we will see that this allows us to talk about the same algorithms, analyze them a little bit differently, and in fact derive some insights that will allow us to actually change the key algorithms a little bit uh, given the theory, uh, improve them and also provide some generalization guarantees. So that, that's going to be our goal, so to develop a theory of generalization. Now, really, we want a little bit more than just generalization. We really have, want to understand a few things. Uh, really, what are the general laws that constrain uh, inductive learning? Uh, what can we learn? Uh, what cannot be learned? Is there even a notion of, you know, you cannot learn these kind of functions? Uh, in general, we want a, a theory that relates a lot of interesting uh, properties, like the probability of successful learning, the number of training examples required for successful learning, how does this relate to the complexity of the space that we are working in, uh, you know, accuracy, uh, the manner in which examples are presented. We talked a little bit about it. So we're not going to cover all of it, but we'll certainly talk a lot about these three uh, components. So, so we are starting about reminding you, with reminding you about quantifying performance. And we actually talked about it a couple of weeks ago, and I'm just going to run through this just to refresh your memory. Right? So, uh, Today, we're going to focus on the number of examples one needs to see before we can say something. Uh, now, notice that when we talked about this conjunction, learning these conjunctions, we, we provided three different learning protocols and showed that the, the learning protocol actually matters. Right? So we talked about the learner uh, proposes instances as queries. We talked about teaching. And we talked about the standard kind of random source of examples. And we showed that these are different. Again, I'm not going to go into the details, uh, but just refresh your memory. Here you suggested a specific protocol, and we showed that we actually need 100 queries to the teacher in order to learn exactly. Right? We got the hypothesis exactly. 
in the second protocol uh, of the teaching, we also got the hypothesis exactly, exactly the, con the target conjunctions, but it took a lot less interactions. And finally, uh, we learned with the random source examples, uh, and we also provided an algorithm. The algorithm was the elimination algorithm. Uh, and I gave you a specific sequence of examples. And it turns out that the final hypothesis was not the target. I told you what the target was, right? So, uh, so this is a key difference between the protocol so far. And then we had to discuss, you know, is this good? What's the performance guarantee that we can, what can we say about performance in the future, given what we've done? What can we say about number of examples that we need to see in order to, uh, to say something? Now, notice that so far, the analysis that we uh, did following this uh, was in terms of number of mistakes, right? We, we now have tools to determine how many mistakes we're going to make before, before we reach the exact target. We can do this for perceptron, we can do this for winner, right? We know how to bound the mistakes, but we don't know how many examples we're going to see, right? It could be that the last mistake you're going to make after a million examples, it's only 100 mistakes, but it's going to take a long time. And whenever I present a mistake to you, an example to you, you will not know, will I make a mistake on it or not? So notice that these two performance uh, measures are different. And today we're going to ditch the number of mistakes and try to think about, in general, number of examples. So, so really, from last time, I said, when we looked at this slide before, I said there are two directions we can go in. One is think about mistake-driven learning and analyze it. We've done this. And the second direction is we're going to analyze this probabilistic intuition of what happens to this X1 that did not disappear from our uh, conjunction. And, and the intuition was the following. We said, well, we never saw X1 in a positive example. Right? Uh, maybe we'll never see it. So maybe it doesn't matter that we did not eliminate X1 from our conjunction. Uh, and even if we will see it, perhaps the fact that we've seen many examples, but X1 was never eliminated, indicates that, you know, it's only going to happen with small probability that it's going to be zero. X1 is going to be zero in a positive example, so it won't hurt us too much. So that probabilistic intuition is what we're going to try to analyze today when we define the PEC framework, the probably approximately correct framework. Right? So that's what we're focusing on. Uh, questions? Okay, so I just want to uh, introduce, reintroduce for maybe the third time some uh, concepts. We're talking about an instant space. A collection. The reason I'm doing it is because I got some questions after the last lecture that indicate to me that some of the abstract concepts are not 100% clear to you. I know that this could be confusing, so I want to make sure that, that this is kind of, uh, you've digested it completely. We, we deal with a space of examples. We typically call it an, the, the instance space, X, and we deal with another space, which is a space of functions two different spaces, examples and functions. Uh, in fact, we deal with several function spaces. One of them is the space of concept, spa concept spaces, sort of the target function is there. And another one is the hypothesis space. This is what our learning algorithm plays with. These are the possibilities that the learning algorithm entertains. Now, this is a real space. We actually touch the hypothesis, the functions there. This is an imaginary space. We don't need, need to really have it. Maybe it doesn't exist, right? Maybe you can uh, sort of instantiate it using a distribution of examples. But we can still think about this as, <coughs> as something that exists. Now, from X, we take a collection of training examples. 
uh, positive and negative examples, uh, basically examples, and then the label that comes from the target concept, and this is our example. Our goal is to determine the hypothesis in H that is equal to F, or eventually a close approximation of F, but it's important for us to figure out, to understand what exactly are we after. And there are two options. Are we after a hypothesis H such that H is equal to F for all X in S? Or such that it's equal to H is equal to F for all X in X, the instance space? Now, this you would say should be relatively easy in general, and it's uninteresting because we care about what's going to happen for, to our performance in the future on previously unseen examples. And this is really uh, an example that would kind of bring this home. Here we are consistent with uh, the example we've seen, but not consistent with all examples that exist in the space. So in order to refine this and talk about it in a more concrete way, I'm going to add a couple of sentences here. So we are going to assume the training instances are generated by a fixed unknown probability distribution, D. And when we learn, we, we want to determine a hypothesis, H, that estimates F, where we evaluate it by its performance on, this, on other instances that are also drawn according to D. So there is this probability distribution that governs the generation of examples, and this probability distribution is fixed. It governs the generation of examples in training. It's going to govern the generation of examples in test. And that's going to be key, as you will see when we do analysis. Because if someone changes the distribution and gives us training from this part of the space, and test us on this part of the space, maybe we, we are not able to do anything, or at least we cannot guarantee that we're going to do anything. Um, okay, so, so you can think about it intuitively uh, in this way. So we have seen many examples according, sampled according to this. Again, we're thinking about this as our example. Uh, and what you can think about is the following uh, diagram here. So F is the target function, the blue circle here, where the way I think about it, everything inside the blue circle are positive examples, even everything outside are the negative examples. And this large rectangle is my universe, the whole instance space. Now, uh, the hypothesis that we learn could be different. Right? These inside the red circle are all the examples that H says are positive, and outside it are all examples that H says are negative. And you can see that because of the way we've learned and because of the examples that we've seen, these are not identical. So in all the positive examples, X1 was active. It's very likely that there will be, it will be active in future positive examples which basically indicates that the symmetric difference, we hope that the symmetric difference between F and H is going to be small because of this. Right? And now, another thing that is important for you to, uh, to think about, this diagram here, don't think about it as uniform distribution. Right? So it's not that the area of these regions represents the probability of you making a mistake because uh, I don't know how to draw it otherwise. Really, what you care about is what is the distribution, what's the support that the distribution gives to each region. Okay? Specifically, if you think about this conjunction, is this picture correct? Yeah. So because we are talking about conjunction, this is part of your homework, H is really a subset of F. We will never make mistakes on positive examples, right? So really the picture should be this, right? So all positive examples of H are also positive examples of F, right? This is the real picture for conjunctions, for monotone conjunctions, the way we do. Okay, so now let's try to analyze it, right? So exactly, again, I want to, we define a notion of error 
And we want to know, is this going to be bad? Is the fact that I left out some x1 here uh, going to impact us and how much it's going to impact us in the future? So, so we're going to give an analysis that actually quantifies this. So, so in order to quantify, I'm going to define for a literal z, I'm going to define p of z to be the probability then in my sample, according to the distribution d, the example is positive and z is false in it. Just a definition, okay? P of z is the probability that z uh, is false in a positive example that I sampled. Now, I claim that that means that the error of my hypothesis H is bounded by the sum of all P of Z's where Z ranges over H, all those that are in H. Let's try to justify it. So we'll go through a few steps. It's, it's actually, you probably see it already. So notice first that P of Z is also the probability that a randomly chosen example is positive and Z is deleted from H. Right? Because it's a conjunction. So if it's positive and Z is false in it, it's going to be deleted. Uh, notice also that if Z is in the target concept, P of Z is zero. Right? I'll never eliminate something that is in the target concept. So my claim is that H will only make mistakes on positive examples. And hopefully it's trivial to you at this point, right? A mistake is made only if Z that is in H but not in F is false in a positive example. And in this case, H is going to say no, uh, but the example is positive. So I'm going to eliminate. Uh, okay, so given that P of Z which I define here to be the example is positive and Z is false in it, P of Z is also the probability that Z is the reason we made a mistake uh, in a randomly drawn example. Now notice that in a given example, I could have multiple reasons for a mistake. Not necessarily one literal is the cause. It could be that it's a positive example and two uh, literals are being eliminated. But I'm going to deal with each one separately. Uh, nevertheless, that there are overlapping reason, reasons, and I'm going to sum these probabilities. And therefore, I get this bound here, right? So essentially what I'm saying, I'm summing all the P of Z's. It's bounded by the sum of the P of Z's uh, on all Z's in H. So I bounded the, the error, okay? So what, what does this give me that I bound this error? So now I claim I can quantify uh, how many examples do I need to see so that I will make small errors in the future. And to do it, I'm going to use the following notation. I'm going to call Z a bad literal if P of Z is greater than epsilon over N. Epsilon is going to be my error eventually. I don't want to make error greater than epsilon. N is the number of variables in my uh, instance space. Uh, so really a bad literal is a literal that on one hand has sufficient probability to appear with a positive example, right? It's greater than epsilon over n, but nevertheless, it never appeared. So I never eliminated it, right? So this is what I call a bad literal something that is heavy enough, so should appear with some probability, but nevertheless, in the example that I've seen so far, hasn't appeared. So my claim is that if, first of all, first claim, if there are no bad literals, my error is bounded by epsilon, right? And this is just an application of the claim we've proved before, because I showed that the error is bounded by the sum of all P of Z's, uh, each P of Z is less than epsilon over n because I have no bad literals. And therefore, the sum is going to be less than epsilon. Uh, but what if there are bad literals? Right? So, so we eliminated the case, or we dealt with the case, 
that there are no bad literals. Now what happens if there are bad literals? So let Z be a, a, a bad literal. So, so what does it do, a bad literal like Z? So what's the probability that it will not be eliminated in a given example? P of Z is greater than epsilon over N, and therefore the probability that it survives an example is 1 minus P of Z, which is less than 1 minus epsilon over N. Okay? This is in one example. You show me an example, and I did not eliminate it, even though it's bad, which means it didn't appear, and that appears, that happens in probability that is 1 minus P of Z, less than 1 minus epsilon over N. Now, this happen m times because I've observed m examples. So the probability that it will not be eliminated by m examples independently drawn is just 1 minus p of z to the m, less than 1 minus epsilon over n to the m because of the assumption of independently sampled examples. Uh, now, this is for one literal. Uh, there are at most n bad literals, so the probability that some bad literal will survive, our x1 from our example, some one will survive, is bounded by n times this. Okay? Simple uh, probability. So, so here is what I have now. Uh, I have a bound on the probability that some bad literal survives all my training data. And what do I want? I want this to be small, right? I, th this is uh, the case where I'm going to make mistakes. So I want the probability that I will make mistakes to be small. I want to try to bound it uh, by some delta, right? So again, I want to choose M, the size of my samples, uh, my training data, large enough so that the probability that some Z survives M examples is less than delta. So, uh, okay, this is just rephrasing of this. So that's what I want. I want the probability that this survives M examples, which is this, to be less than delta. Uh, and really, I'm seeking here to figure out a bound on M. How large should M be so that I know that the probability that I will make an epsilon error Remember that here we showed that epsilon is the bound of my error. Uh, so the probability that I will make epsilon error is going to be small, less than delta. So I'm going to, in order to isolate m from here, I'm going to use this inequality that you've probably seen. 1 minus x uh, is less than e to the minus x. You can refresh your memory, do, I don't know, Taylor... Uh, expansion, and you'll see it. Uh, and therefore, I'm going to, so my x here is this epsilon over n, so I'm replacing 1 minus x with e to the minus x, and I'm getting this. So it's, it's sufficient to require that n times e to the minus m epsilon over n is less than delta. And here, it's easier to isolate m, I'm I can just take log on both sides, and when I do this, I get that M needs to be larger than something that behaves like N over epsilon and is logarithmic in N and is logarithmic in 1 over delta. So the interesting thing from you, from your perspective here, it's inversely proportional in epsilon. Makes sense, right? So if I want small error, I'm going to pay and have larger M. Also, inversely proportion in, in delta, actually in log of delta, but, uh, which means if you want delta to be small, sort of the bound, the probability that you'll not make errors or you'll make small errors to be small, you're going to pay in looking at more examples. So, more examples. So this actually should make sense here. So I need to see at least these many examples to guarantee a probability of failure this uh, epsilon less than delta. So really the theorem is 
that we proved is the following. If m is as above, then with probability at least 1 minus delta, there are no bad literals. Or, equivalently, if m is as above, with probability 1 minus delta, my error is going to be less than epsilon. Okay, so what is the game we've played here? We used our algorithm to learn conjunctions. We don't know if the conjunction we ended up with is the right one or not, because no one told us what's the right conjunction. But what we prove now is that if you choose the number of examples you presented to your algorithm appropriately, you had your own epsilon and your own delta. I don't know what they are, but maybe you chose something. Accordingly, you chose an M. If you've given your algorithm these many examples, you know that it's going to be okay. Every future example that you'll see, with probability at least 1 minus delta, will have a small error. Now, you can plug in some numbers, and you'll see that the number actually come up pretty large. Uh, for N, 100, dimensionality of 100, for 0.1, 0.1, you need almost 7,000 examples. It's a large number. Uh, but you can reduce n to 10, and then 0.1, 0.1 gives you only 460 examples. Notice that even if you want a much, much better delta, that doesn't impact the number of examples so much because it depends on, one over, on log 1 over delta. Okay, so, uh, so basically we solved the conjunction problem. Right? We know for conjunctions that we can get some guarantees. But of course, we want a little bit more than that. Right? So we want a more general theory. But this gives you the intuition of why uh, we can actually do something. We can prove something in general about uh, generalization. So let's step uh, again back up to see what is the general game we're playing here. So, so essentially, what is the prediction theory in general that we, we can talk about? So again, we have an instance space. We have an output space, which is plus or minus 1 in this case. We are making predictions using this function hypothesis that we are learning. There is a distribution D. It's not known, but it's fixed. Uh, and there is a set of examples that we've learned, that, that we are using in order to learn. So, once we have this notation, we can define the notion of a true error. This is the generalization that we're going to make, right? The real error relative to the distribution that we have no clue what it is, D, the probability under D that H is different than Y. Y is the label in our uh, set of examples. Uh, and there's a notion of empirical error, what we can measure on our training data, which is written here, right? The probability of X being in S, such that this different, is different, which is, you know, just, a, just an expectation. So, given that, we can ask the question, can we describe or bound the true error given that we can see what we see, the empirical error? That's our goal, right? Uh, moreover, we can ask another question for which I'm going to introduce the notion of a function space, the set of target functions, and the set of hypothesis space, the set of possible hypotheses that we are entertaining. And now we can ask, is C learnable? Now that I have a notion of, can I relate, can I get small to error, I can ask, can I learn C? Where I'm going to define what learn is in a couple of slides, but intuitively that means if I can minimize this gap between empirical error and true error, I'm going to say that I can learn it, right? It's okay. If I cannot, I cannot learn it. We'll have to see whether this can ever happen. Are there things that we cannot learn and are there things that we can learn? But, but at least once we have these definitions, you can imagine that we can ask this question. Is it possible to learn a given function in C using functions from H, given this learning protocol that we have? So this is, this is kind of the general type of questions that we, we want to uh, ask. Questions? Okay. 
So, uh, again, th this is really key here. So, at this point, it should be clear for that, that we cannot expect the learner to learn a concept exactly. Right? Uh, there will generally be way too many concepts that are consistent with what I've seen so far. Uh, uh, and those that I haven't seen potentially could take any label, modulus some assumptions. Uh, so we have to agree to misclassify some uncommon examples under some definition of uncommon that will have to relate to either F uh, assumptions on F or the probability distribution. So we can't even expect always to learn a close approximation to the target concept. Because sometimes the sample that we see is just not representative. Right? So even if there is a probability distribution, it so happened that we did not sample uh, a representative sample or not sample something that is similar enough to what we're going to be evaluated on. So we will not be able to learn close approximation. So really the only realistic expectation is of, a good of a good learner is that with high probability, it will learn a close approximation. So with high probability means this delta, or this 1 minus delta, and the close approximation is the error that we're going to make the epsilon. That's why I need a delta and an epsilon when I define learning. And now we can come with the definition. So this is the goal of the probably approximately correct uh, framework. Uh, in this framework, one requires that given small parameters, epsilon and delta, with probability at least 1 minus delta, we produce a hypothesis with error at most epsilon. And, and really, it's important to realize that the only reason we can do this is this consistent distribution assumption. The fact that there is one probability distribution, unknown, but it exists, that governs the generation of the data, both the training data and eventually what we care about. Uh, okay, so, so here is a concrete definition uh, of, of learnability, of PEC learnability. So, I'm considering a concept class defined over instance space X, uh, instances of length N, L is my learner, and it's making use of a hypothesis space H. At this point, all these notions have to be completely clear to you, uh, and if it's not, ask. I'm going to say that the concept class C, this is a collection of functions, is spec learnable using L, using algorithm L and hypothesis class H, if for all functions in F, for all distributions D over X, and for some fixed epsilon and delta, uh, the algorithm L, given a collection of M examples that are sampled independently according to D, produces with probability at least 1 minus delta a hypothesis that has error at most epsilon. Okay? Hopefully this makes sense now. Now, I want, of course, M to be, because we are computer scientists, we care about this, M has to be polynomial in some reasonable complexity parameter here. So the reasonable complexity parameter is 1 over epsilon, 1 over delta, N, and the size of H. How many possibilities will the learning algorithm consider. Uh, now, so this is one part of the definition. I can also add something about efficiency. So far, all I said is that I'm going to use M examples, and I want M to scale reasonably well, not to be exponential in the, the reasonable complexity parameter. I didn't say anything about how long it's going to take me. And I can add this, and I'm going to say that C is efficiently learnable if L does that, also in time that is polynomial in the complexity parameters. So we're going to take both components of the, the definition, both what we're going to call sample complexity and time complexity as our learning definition. 
Okay, so, uh, so really we imposed two limitations. One is sample complexity, as I said, the number of examples we need. Two, the number, the time it takes us. Right, so, so to be peck learnable, there must be a hypothesis with arbitrarily small error, because I can choose epsilon any way I want, for every f, right? I don't know which one is f. You just tell me f is somewhere in this class. Eventually, I'm going to drop the notion of a class, but let's think about it now. It's a class of linear functions, a class of polynomials of degree two, a class of, you know, rectangles in the, in the plane. Uh, I don't know which one is going to be there, and I want to be able to satisfy the condition for each candidate that you choose. Now, notice that in general, we need to assume H is larger than C. Because if H is not larger than C, what could happen? We cannot. We could have missed the target completely, what, which means what? Using terminology that we used before. F is in C, but if H is not greater than C, superset of C, then F might not be in H, which means I will never be able to con be consistent with it, right? There are going to be examples in which H necessarily differs from C, for, from F. No chance to be consistent, right? So at this point, until a little bit later today, I still want that. I want to be consistent. I want to be able to be consistent. So there is also an old definition that people don't use so much today where they say that uh, C is properly peck learnable if H is equal to C. Uh, but we, we won't actually use it. So notice, though, that this definition is a worst-case definition, right? So the algorithm must meet the criteria for every distribution, This is called the distribution free assumption, and for every target function. And, and I'm going to justify this. Why is that important? So the target function is something that we're going to drop because we're just going to talk about a distribution over x cross y. But for every distribution, it's going to be crucial for us to be able to say something about the possibility of learning. Okay. So, so, so far we talked about conjunctions, and hopefully you agree that Everything is going to be okay with conjunctions. And then we use this to motivate a general definition of learnability. So now, let's forget conjunction and talk about, in general, what can I say about learnability. And I'm going to prove a theorem that is called Occam's Razor. Uh, and we'll see in a second why it's called Occam's Razor. Yes? For only every F. No. So, so these are completely, F and D are completely orthogonal things. So F is the target function. You are learning a conjunction, say, or a linear threshold function. Now, there exists a distribution today, and you're going to sample from this distribution, present example to my algorithm, I'm going to learn, and then you're going to sample more data, and you're going to test me. Tomorrow, with the same F, there could be another D that governs the generation of these examples. To be PEC learnable, I need to show you that it doesn't matter which D you're sampled according to, it's going to be okay. Yeah? So I have a feeling that it depends a lot on the sampling of the data. So basically, if I sample randomly and say every random sample gives me a different distribution, so let's, let's do this slide and then ask the question again. Okay, so uh, here is what I want to show. I want to prove the following claim. The probability, so now I'm in a completely general setting. I didn't tell you what is F, what is H, what is D. But I have F, I have C, H, D, and an instance space X. 
And I want to argue that the probability, up, okay, the probability that there exists a hypothesis in H that one is consistent with my M examples, two, its error is greater than epsilon, that is, it's bad, right? Is small. How small? It's less than 1 minus epsilon to the m times the size of the hypothesis class. So that's a sensible claim to try to prove, right? Basically, I want to say that I don't want it to be the case that if I've learned something, that is, I was consistent with all the training data, it's still bad. It still makes a lot of error, right? So I don't want this to happen. Or I want that these two happen together with a small probability. And it's natural to assume that this small, I, I want this small probability to go smaller as m goes up, right? Which is what I show you. So, so first of all, let's prove this. And the proof really is very similar to what we've done before, only that now I'm not talking about conjunction. So let's assume that H is such a bad hypothesis. That is, it satisfies both one and two. Then the probability that it's consistent with one example is less than one minus epsilon, right? Because of this, right? Its error is greater than epsilon, so the probability that it's, it predicts correctly on this example is uh, less than one minus epsilon. Now, I'm going to observe M examples that are drawn independently of each other, and the probability that H is consistent with all of them is therefore less than one minus epsilon to the M. Now, this is for this specific hypothesis. The probability that some hypothesis in my capital H space is doing it is this times the size of H, just a union bound. And so basically, I proved uh, that uh, these two are going to happen together with this probability. Now, notice here that I really don't need F for this argument, really. I can deal, I need H, and I can say that I'm sampling examples from X cross Y, and, and instead of writing here H is equal to F, I can say H is equal to Y, where Y is the label of X in my sample. Just an issue of convenience. Now, let's go back to your question. What, what do I uh, need here? I don't know what D is. All I know that there exists a D. Right? So it's true that uh, this epsilon and delta, I'm going to choose epsilon and delta, and it could happen that, you know, the sample is going to be good or bad, but worst case, <coughs> This is what's going to happen, right? Irrespective of D, okay? So now let's see what this gives us. So again, what I care about is I care about that this guy is going to be small, and uh, I, I want to isolate M to see how small it's going to be. So I'm going to do the same thing as before. I want this to be less than delta. Uh, I'm just doing the algebra a little bit different than before, but still I'm using the fact that e to the minus x is less than 1 minus x. Uh, and when you replace it there, or you can first take the log and then replace it, do whatever you want, you isolate m, and this is what you get. You get that m has to be greater than 1 over epsilon. Makes sense, right? times something that depends, again, on 1 over delta, or ln 1 over delta. And what I get here is ln size of h, before I add their n, which is kind of the log of the number of conjunctions. And this is really very important. So first of all, for the first time, and this is why we call this Occam's razor, the first time we see that we have a preference towards small hypothesis spaces. Because if you have a large hypothesis space, sort of a large set of options that the learner can choose from, 
you're going to pay in the number of examples you have to see. And it makes a lot of sense, right? If the learner has a lot of flexibility, uh, you need to see more examples in order to converge to something. So, so really you see a preference to this. Um, so, but this immediately gives us uh, an algorithmic perspective. I mean, so I'm calling it here the consistent learner scheme. What does it tell us about this consistent learning scheme? It's, it says all you need from a learner is look at these M examples with the appropriate M given your desired epsilon and delta. Look at these M examples, be consistent with them, and it's going to be good. That's what the theorem says, right? If you are consistent with the M examples, life is going to be good in the future. With high probability, 1 minus delta, you're not going to make more than uh, epsilon error. That's what it says, right? Agreed? Go back to here. If M is chosen appropriately, then if you are consistent, your error is going to be less than this. Right? Or the probability of this is going to be as small as you want, delta. So with probability 1 minus delta, this is not going to happen, which means if you are consistent, your error is going to be less than epsilon. So basically what we said on the consistent learner scheme is it's a good generic learning algorithm. Well, learning paradigm at least, right? So we showed that an M consistent hypothesis generalizes as well as error less than epsilon. Now, I didn't tell you how to generate, how to get to H. I just told you, if when I give you a sample, you manage to find something that is consistent with it, you should be happy. Is this clear? So this is a very generic learning algorithm. Well, it's not an algorithm yet, but it's a general uh, kind of scheme for a learning algorithm. Questions? Yeah. We have to. Very good question. Are we assuming that capital H is a superset of all the functions we may care about? We have to because otherwise we will never be, co we, we cannot guarantee that we are consistent. Right? So at this point, yes, H is a superset of what I call C. Yeah. We're going to relax this a little bit later. Yeah. Yes? Then, then this will not be valid, right? No, no, it's, it's valid. It goes into my delta. Right? So you can, there is, let's assume there is a target function. Right? And now you're sampling examples that are labeled according to this target function. It's possible that you are a very bad sampler and you sampled it bad and now when you give me a new example, I have no idea. I mean, I'm going to make mistakes. But all I'm claiming, I proved that this goes with probability less than 1 minus delta. Or less than delta, sorry. Okay? So I, I already account for the fact that the sample uh, is bad. And I proved to you that if I'm consistent with the M from your bad sample, with high probability it's going to be okay. With some probability, it's not going to be okay. This is exactly the, the bad sampling uh, case. Yes? Okay, so, okay, so, so what, was a, what would H look like when I'm learning a linear uh, function? It's going to be the set of all Ws of some dimensionality. It's infinite. Very good question. So you're saying, you know, what I'm, you're telling me now is actually ln size of h, and h is finite. So that's another caveat here. So, so already you identify two caveats. One of them is maybe I don't want to think about c, and that's going to be easy to get rid of. 
And another one that's going to be harder to get rid of, and we'll do it only next time, is h is finite. Everything I showed so far, and I'm going to keep on until the end of today, h is finite, and you're right, we'll have to relax it because it's uninteresting to only be able to deal with finite hypothesis spaces. So we'll have to replace the size of H with something that we can associate also with an infinite hypothesis space. So keep these two uh, in mind and we'll, we'll get to it. So far, but, but the cool thing is that everything we said with C, we can say without C. Everything we say for a finite hypothesis space, we can say for infinite hypothesis space. It, really the same theorem that I show here, I'm going to show for infinite hypothesis space. I'm going to replace this with something else. Uh, so, so still listen carefully. It's, it's very relevant. It's exactly the same theorems. I'm just starting small. And, and still the, the question here in terms of intuition is really important. I told you this theorem, this Occam razors, really shows for the first time that we like small hypothesis spaces. So uh, you can see that there is this trade-off between larger hypothesis spaces and small hypothesis spaces. Uh, so on one hand, to guarantee consistency, we need larger hypothesis spaces. On the other hand, Occam's razor here tells us you want smaller hypothesis spaces. And we will see another uh, dimension comes, coming into the picture, which is going to be complexity. Sometimes we didn't say how are we going to be consistent. What, what's the algorithm that will lead us to be consistent with the M examples? And we'll see that bring, this brings another issue in terms of preferring small or large hypothesis spaces. It's easier to search in large hypothesis spaces than in small, combinatorially. And, and we'll get examples for this. Okay, so, so where are we now? We, we agree that consistent learners are good. Uh, and so, so basically, immediately from the definition, we have the following recipe for PEC learning. Given a sample of M examples, find some H that is consistent, and you're done. We already showed that if M is large enough, a consistent hypothesis is going to be good, close enough to F, error less than epsilon. You just have to make sure that M is not too large, right? It's not exponentially large. You want it to be polynomial uh, in the right parameters and larger than this. Uh, of course, there is the computational complexity issue. How did you compute this consistent hypothesis? You want to show that this is, you can do this efficiently. Yes. Why not? So, so when we learned conjunctions, we had an algorithm that allowed H to be consistent with the training data. So t keep this example here. In the future, in, in five minutes, I'm going to relax this a little bit to say, don't be consistent, but be pretty good. Okay? And then we'll, our generalization is going to be a function of how consistent we can be or how pretty good we can be. But for now, let's think about our empirical error as being zero. Later, it's going to be something small, not zero. But everything that I say here is going to apply. Okay, so, so that's, that's a consistent learner, modulo an algorithm, right? So notice that in conjunctions, we had an algorithm. We used the elimination algorithm. We found the hypothesis that is consistent with the training set, right? Uh, it was easy. And then directly, at the beginning of today's lecture, directly I proved that if we have sufficiently many examples, then H was close enough to the target function. That was the first proof that we did directly for conjunction. Now notice I didn't have to do it, because now that I have this Occam's razor algorithm, it's a generic proof. I didn't have to prove specifically for conjunction. But, but uh, you could see that it's really the same proof. Okay, so, so we can take a lot of other examples. For example, we can think about conjunction in general, not monotonic conjunction. The hypothesis space is 3 to the n. You know that already. 
and I can just plug in and say, okay, so what I need is this number of examples. And if I have an algorithm that uh, finds a consistent hypothesis with conjunctions, I'm done, because this M is good, right? It's just polynomial in N, in 1 over epsilon, and in 1 over delta. And I give you some numbers here that you can look at and see, but it doesn't matter. So this, this result is independent of the algorithm. Any consistent learner for conjunction is going to have these bounds. I can generalize more, right? I can talk about harder hypothesis classes. For example, I can talk about KCNF. What is KCNF? It's a CNF, so it's a conjunction of these junctions. All of you have seen CNFs. If not, you see it now. Try to understand. So, uh, again, I have an algorithm. But this is a very, very interesting class, right? It's a very general class. It says this, and this or this or this or this or this, or this or this or this or this or this, <laughs> sorry, and this or this or this or this or this, and, and so on. So it's a very general thing. In fact, if I allow k to be too large, any Boolean function is like this, but I want to fix, to keep k fixed here. It's very important. K is fixed independent of N. Uh, but I have an algorithm. All I need to do is take a sample, find a hypothesis that is consistent, and then determine the sample complexity. And it's very easy to determine the sample complexity. All I need is to count how many functions are here. And you can do it. How many functions are here? I'm kind of helping you here. So notice that F is a conjunction of things where each one of these things is a disjunction of up to k things. So how many disjunction of up to k things are there? 2n, because there are n variables and then their negation, 2n literals. 2n choose k is the number of disjunctions I can have, right? 2n choose k. Once I have the set of all disjunctions, any subset of them could be my KCNF. So it's 2 to the 2 n choose K, which is written here. Now, if you take log of this, you just get something like n to the K. K is fixed, polynomial. So the size of the hypothesis class is polynomial in N. I'm happy. So I can learn it in, in principle. The only question is, how do I learn it? I need an algorithm. What would be your algorithm? Right, so what I showed so far is a scheme for learning. <coughs> Take M examples, be consistent. I gave you a theorem that says it's going to be okay. But we still need an algorithm that is consistent with the M examples. What will be the algorithm here? Diaz? Well, the only thing we really know how to learn are the linear functions, right? Or conjunctions. Notice this is a conjunction. But it's not a conjunction over x1 through xn. So what will you do? What? We can use kernels. Say it another way. What does it mean? What will you do? Will will expand our feature space, right? So I'm going to change the feature space. Instead of being <coughs> over the xi's, it's going to be over these disjunctions. Every disjunction now is going to be a feature for me. So I'm going to generate the space of all the disjunctions, uh, uh, define a new set of features, one for each clause of size k, if this junction of size k. And I already sh said that there are only two n to the k like this, polynomial. So I blew up my feature space. You can do it with a kernel, but we need to prove something. So we're going to say what we're doing. It doesn't matter how we do it. And once we do it, I have an algorithm for learning monotone conjunctions, and I'm done. The only thing is that now my feature space is not of size n, but rather of size n to the k. Uh, so, so I have an algorithm. Uh, here is an example. Uh, n equal 4, k equal 2. The y's, these are all the disjunction. It's just 
4 choose 2, which happens to be 6. So these are all the new features that I have, and now I'm going to learn a conjunction over this. It's, and, and we can do it. I also did give you the example. So someone gave you examples in the X space. This is a positive, positive. All, all these are positive examples. It's all happened. And you generated the example in the six-dimensional space this way. There is something very important here that you see. Uh, that has to do with distributions. So, and it explains why it was important to me to put into the, the definition, or to Valiant that introduced this concept, the notion of distribution free. I need to learn for all possible distributions. Someone told me, you know what, don't worry, just have an algorithm for the uniform distribution because I'm going to give you this example from the uniform distributions. What happens when you transform your feature space? You change the distribution. In fact, this is not a uniform distribution. This is a very restricted distribution that is a function of the original distribution, but also of the transformation. For example, prove to me that this is not a uniform distribution. Okay, that's, that's one, so a lot of, only one way to get to zero, 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 and many ways to get to all ones. You can also show me that there are some dependencies. Some examples will never appear. For example, if you look at this, you see that if Y1 is on and Y4 is on, Y2 must be on, right? Because Y1 means that one or two are on, four means that two or three are on, this is on. So you'll never have an example where Y1 is on, Y4 is on, and Y2 is not on. Cannot be the uniform distribution. So you see that the distribution free assumption is crucial. We'll see it again when we talk about boosting, for example. It's really a crucial assumption to, uh, to our definition. Okay, so I'm not getting all the way to relaxing the two of the things that we wanted to relax. We're going to get to it uh, on Tuesday, but really try to understand the definition. We're going to continue with it, generalize it a little bit, and, and bring it to a very realistic situation. So far, we are still a little bit uh, unrealistic with questions, final questions. Okay, so have a good weekend. Someone cheat their pack bound by using a training set, and like two training sets, doing one training set where they, they 